Good morning. My name is Thomas. I'm on staff at Calvary. It's a joy to be with you and continue in our series in the book of Daniel. If you've got your Bible, grab, grab it, open up. Old Testament prophet. A guy named Daniel is an exile living outside his homeland in a culture that does not love his God. And we've been asking this question, how does someone remain faithful in an environment that has what we've called a current, a worldview, a set of values that opposes the things of God? How do you remain faithful in such a place? Because you're not, you're not starting a culture war. You're not fighting everybody. You're not angry with everybody. You're not violent. But you want to live out your convictions and be honorable to God. And Daniel has presented many, many scenarios in which he has both privately and publicly lived what we've called a winsome life. Winsome in the sense of he's displaying his faith in such a way that it confronts the ideology of the day that perhaps some are one to the faith. We've seen many people that have interacted with Daniel be won over to see who is this God. And so we continue chapter by chapter looking at how Daniel lived. And before we get into chapter five today, I want to ask you guys this question. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? What is it? Lady Justice. Who said Lady Justice? Yeah, Lady Justice. Lady Justice lives in almost all courtrooms in the United States. In fact, lives in many places of judicial, um, sorry, of judicial uh, need or law around the world. And it's a symbol of justice. She is blindfolded because we say justice is blind. Not that it's indifferent, but it's unbiased. And she holds out her scales so that you can weigh the evidence. There's two sides to every story. And so each, of, each story gets to present the evidence and be weighed in these scales. And then a verdict can be made. And she has a sword. And this sword is to cut through lies, to get to the truth, and execute a verdict. And so this is Lady Justice, the symbol of justice, unbiased justice in our world. How many of you, don't raise your hands, have been in a court of law and been weighed by Lady Justice. <laughs> I have. Maybe it's a speeding ticket. Maybe it's a car accident. Maybe you did some stuff. I don't know. But here's my question. How well would you fare if you stepped onto the unbiased, perfect judgment, the scales of God, where he takes your whole life lived and he weighs it out. This is what we encounter in Daniel chapter five, is there's another king, another person in authority that has produced a cultural ethic of the day and his life and his actions are put in the scales of God. Do you wanna see how he fares? All right, let's go, Daniel chapter five, starting in verse one. We meet this new king. We've been looking at Nebuchadnezzar for some time now. And the same issues that Nebuchadnezzar struggled with are passed down to his offspring. And then we're going to see that pride once again rears its head. Now we meet this king named Belshazzar. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of of the thousand. So the first thing he's doing, he's throwing a political party of all of the lords, of all of his political alliances, and he is drinking with them, which is unusual for kings of the day. Perhaps he would throw a party for them to drink, but he participates with them in their drunkenness. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. And so he pulls out the glory days of his dad and says, bring all those holy vessels that we captured from the temple in Jerusalem. Those things that Daniel's people would use in worship and bring them to this party. Take the sacred things of Israel that we might fill our goblets with them 
and incorporate them in our worship service here. I mean, this is, a, this is a bad dude doing some bad things. What basically has happened is he's trying to have a political alliance, make sure he's shoring up all of his relationships, and he throws for them this sensual, drunken orgy. And, and many people are asking, why is he doing that? Because historically, remember Daniel's, Daniel's book is a historical document, and the extra biblical texts and archeological evidence we have of the day is this is extremely accurate of what happened in Babylon and, and the kings in Babylon and the sequence of things in Babylon. What we know historically is that in 539, Babylon is sacked and the Medo-Persian empire begins under this man, Darius and Cyrus. And when that happens is the week before this party that Cyrus and Darius, the, the whole Medo-Persian army comes in and defeats Babylon about 10 days before this party. And this night is the night that they have snuck in to Babylon. And Babylon thought they were impenetrable. They had these massive walls. They, they, they had the river the Euphrates River that would flow underneath the walls and provide a water source to the city so that it was impossible to lay siege to the city because it can continue to feed itself and water itself. But un unknown to Belshazzar, Darius has diverted the Euphrates. They have, they have dug out canals and the story tells us that the water flowed through these canals and which lowered the water level of the Euphrates so that the Medo-Persian army could come underneath the walls. And there, the enemy is at the gates and he's throwing this party. This is so, he has so much pride in his heart that he's undefeatable. And he's trying to shore up his political alliances. So even if he's taken, maybe he'll become a vassal king and everyone will still have allegiance to him. And so he is throwing this party and he is bringing out old trophies from his father's cabinet and they're incorporating it in these events. Verse three, they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They take the sacred things of God and they warp them for their use. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. I mean, this became a worship service. Verse five, immediately, the finger of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand, and the king saw the hand as it wrote. Just so you know, that's crazy. Right? I mean, it's like, I didn't see that happen. I haven't seen something like that. So that is wild. Verse 6. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His, his limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. You might say, he sobered up really quick. And he is, he's terrified and doesn't know what to do because he can't read the inscription. He doesn't know what has been written. And so he calls in all the wise men. This is another episode in which the council of the king comes in and he starts asking the enchanters, the sorcerers, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, what does this say? If anyone here can tell me what this says, I will give them gold and silver. I'll give them a robe and I will make them the third most powerful person in the kingdom. And the counsel of the king comes in and no one can interpret it. But there's this amazing woman. There's this amazing wise woman who knows where the king should go. Check out verse 10. The queen now, this is not his wife. Remember, the wives and the concubines, they're part of this party. This is probably the queen mother. Maybe, perhaps, this is Nebuchadnezzar's wife. I mean, it's been 23 years since Nebuchadnezzar died. And Belshazzar has been king. So perhaps it's her, because she comes in, and this is what she says, the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, because they're terrified, came into the banquet hall. She wasn't part of it. And the queen declared, O oh, king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. Verse 11 says, there's a man. There is a man in your kingdom 
that you have not paid attention to. He was near and dear to your father, Nebuchadnezzar. His name is Daniel. And she calls him Daniel. She doesn't call him by his slave name, Belshazzar. She says, there's a man named Daniel from Judea, from Jerusalem, that was brought with the exiles and the spirit of the gods. Like that spirit lives in him. And he has wisdom and discernment and understanding from heaven and has helped your father know things that can help you once again. And so he goes and finds this Daniel. And Daniel comes in and, and he gives him the spiel. If you can tell me what's been written on this wall, I'll give you all this money and I'll give you this position in my, in my kingdom. And Daniel's like, I really don't want any of that. I don't really want any of that. It's like a business promoting people to be president right before they're taken over by another company. It's like, hey, do you want to be the president? Awesome. Now there's a new company coming in and, and you're no longer the president. And so Daniel's like, just keep all your political favors to yourself. And that's not why I'm here. So verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, this is, this is this winsome principle. How does Daniel live in the midst of a culture that's even taking his items and they're using it part of their worship service? He's not getting angry or violent. He says, nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. The principle is this. Daniel says, in the midst of all of this current that's against him, I will help you know what God's word says and its interpretation so that you can understand it. That's it. Is he's been brought in before this company in the lifestyle they've been living and Daniel just comes in and says, I will help you know what God's word has said and its interpretation so that you can decide what you'll do with that. And he begins to unpack for Belshazzar this, this contrast between him and his father. He says, you know, your king, when your father, Nebuchadnezzar, he had the same issue of pride and God humbled him and he repented and he elevated God over his life and his kingdom was spared. Let's see if he does the same thing. Verse 20, 22. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. The first accusation, the first verdict cast is, King, you know the ways of your father who humbled himself, who honored God, but you have not. You're not guilty because you lack understanding. You're guilty because you have suppressed understanding. What you are guilty of is knowing and not practicing. And this is a danger for, for us who attend a Bible teaching church like Calvary, is we love to open up our Bibles and know what God's word has said. But it's not the knowledge of his word that really matters. It's knowing it and practicing it. It's knowing it and, and doing it. It's knowing it and, might I say, obeying it. Like when Jesus said, go make disciples, that's what we're here, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to what? Know all the things that I've said? That's not what he says. He says to observe, which takes knowledge and practice. Teach them to know and practice all that I have taught. And so first, Daniel comes in and says, this is the verdict. You have the heart like your dad. You're prideful. But he humbled himself. And what you have done is taken what you knew and have suppressed it. You see, Nebuchadnezzar is the first generation believer. Nebuchadnezzar did not have faith in God before Daniel's arrival. That's why we're calling it winsome faith, is that he would live in such a way as that maybe you would win some to the faith. And Nebuchadnezzar has been won over by the ways in which Daniel and God has put himself on display. And Belshazzar has not walked in the faith of his fathers. 
has not walked in the faith of his mother and his parents, of his grandparents. He has rejected all of that. He's done what many youths do. And they say, the generations before us, we reject everything that they believe. We reject everything they stood for. We reject their gods. And I will start afresh and be my own self-defining, self-determining individual. Generational faith is so hard to pass along, isn't it? For grandparents in the room who perhaps you were first-generation believers, just because you're a believer doesn't make your kids a believer or your grandkids a believer. Belief is really at the individual level. And we want to live in such a way as to display our faith in such an appealing way that those who would follow us in our families would be convinced that God's ways are the good ways. They would watch in the ways in which we trust the Lord, worship the Lord, see the Lord in our own life, that they too would be captured by our faith. But it's their decision to make. And Belshazzar has not embraced the faith of his fathers. He has suppressed what he has known. Verse 23, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them and you have praised the gods of silver and of gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. This is the the second and third. Not only have you suppressed God's knowledge, the knowledge of God, but then you've taken what is sacred and you have misused it in your own worship. So now you started worshiping other gods with it. So you have an idolatry problem. But the God in whose hand your in whose hand is your breath, the one who gives you your next breath, whose are all your ways you have not honored. So what's Belshazzar's problem? I have not humbled my heart. I have suppressed what has been taught to me, and I have not honored God who gives me the breath in my lungs. That's the verdict. Verse 24, then from his presence, the hand was sent. So you're praising these guys, don't have any eyes, no ears. They don't don't hear and see the activity here. But there's a living God who interacts with the things of men. He's a divine actor in our world, and it's his hand that you have seen. And this writing was inscribed. Now, the hand of God is is a wild thing. The finger of God has been mentioned before in the scriptures. And remember in Exodus While Israel is in Egypt as slaves, there are these 10 plagues that are sent that Egypt would know who the living God is and that Pharaoh would not harden his heart, but he would release God's people to go to the land of promise. And after the third plague, this is Exodus 8, verse 18, I believe. Actually, no, it's 8, 19. All of the counsel of Pharaoh comes to him looking at these plagues and says, Pharaoh... This is the finger of God on Egypt. Like we're seeing God's activity in our lives. When Egypt finally let Israel go, they went to Sinai. And at Sinai, they received the commandments, the laws of God. This is Exodus 31, verse 18. And this is where God is said to, with his finger, inscribe the law of God on stone tablets. The psalmist, Psalm 8, looks at the creation and says, the heavens and the creation was done by the finger of God. God is doing these things. And so when the hand of God shows up in Babylon, it's the activity of God to make himself known here. And that's what Daniel's saying. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, mene, tekel, and parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And what God's word says that Daniel then interprets so the king can understand 
is almost a message for all of us. Your, ne- your days are numbered. Your lives are weighed. And a verdict will be cast. That's a sobering thought. Someone in first service afterwards said, man, I wish you would have told me what was coming in service. I wasn't ready to hear these things. None of us are. Belshazzar was not. In the middle of his affairs, simply God's word speaks, your your days are numbered. There's a number to them. Your lives are weighed. And a verdict will be cast. And for Belshazzar, what a line. You have been weighed and found what? Wanting. Like you came up short. You're too light. Your debt is not paid. Now, why is he found wanting? What what causes that verdict to be cast? Is his pride. This is the whole thing. This This is what Daniel's been saying. It's the pride of your heart, the pride in your heart to suppress the knowledge that you knew, to throw these festivities, to bring the sacred things of God in, and then to worship other gods and not honor God himself. That's the verdict. And this is how it ends. Verse 29, then Belshazzar gave the command and and Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Hearing all of this, does that sound like a king who follows in the ways of his father Nebuchadnezzar and humbles himself? This man still, in his arrogance and pride, says, well, Daniel, I know you don't want this, but I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to make you the third in my kingdom. It's my kingdom still. There is no humility in this man's life, unlike his father. And in verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius, the Mede, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So according to history, that night is when they came into Babylon. And it was over. It was over. And we look at Belshazzar and we say, okay, man, that is a bad king who's filled with pride, who suppresses the knowledge that was given to him and does not honor God. Of course, if you put him in the scales, he would be found wanting. And then the apostle Paul tells us, it's not just Belshazzar's problem. This is the problem of the human race. This is Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one, Paul lays out the problem of humanity. Listen to this. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. By their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. So they take what they know and they suppress it, they put it away so we can live any way we want. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. So it's not because he's hidden himself. He's actually revealed himself as God in his creation so that it would be made known plain to every human being. Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Like you just look around the world, look around Colorado in this beautiful place and you see trees and mountains and streams and it's all in order. You look at the stars, the heavens, the sun, the moon, and it controls our tides perfectly. You look around and you go, man, it's like there's a God and he's not trying to hide it. He's trying to show you plainly that there's a creator. But we suppress, that's what he says. The fault is that in our pride, we suppress what has been made known plainly. Richard Dawkins, probably one of the most famous atheists of our day, he's a, he's a biologist. In his biology book, he opens up with a definition of biology. This is the definition that Dawkins gives. Biology is the study of things that appear to be made, but are not. Like, that's the definition. What does that sound like? What is made known plainly, just looks like it's created everywhere. It's not. 
That's the fault of humanity. Is in our pride, we have suppressed what we have known. We're in the same boat as Belshazzar. So they're without excuse, Paul says. There's no excuse. For although they knew God, they did not, what, honor him as God. This is, this is our problem. They didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they came, became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. And so we're back with Belshazzar. You have suppressed what your family has made known to you. It's not that you're ignorant of these things. It's that you've actively pushed them away. And then you have taken the holy things of God and exchanged them brought them into your worship service of gold, silver, wood, bronze, the things of this world that are man-made, that don't have eyes to see or ears to hear what's going on. But the living God, the living God sees all things and you have not honored him. He's the one that gives you breath in your lungs to do all this and you have not honored him. We're in the same boat. The root issue of the human heart that causes all sorts of problematic fruit is pride. It's when we set ourselves up against God. Now, it's not very hard to imagine the days like Belshazzar and how they play out in our world today. There is a lot of pride in our world today. And there's a good pride, there's a good sense of pride. Like take pride in your work, take pride in your family. It's kind of like when God sees his son Jesus baptized, he says, that's my son in whom I'm well pleased. Like he's pleased with his work, he's pleased with his son. That's a good pride. A bad pride is the pride of arrogance and self-exaltation to self-define and determine your life over another and against God. And the soil in which we live in the Western world is saturated with pride. And so we have the pride that comes from knowledge. Think of all the things that we know today more than anyone probably on the planet before us. And it puffs us up. We have our pride in our medical achievements. Look what we can do with medicine. It's our pride that has produced such wealth of luxuries and comforts. It is a pride that has created, created for us technologies that we enjoy, that has connected us with the world around us. It is the pride that keeps us young into our old age, tries to keep our beauty for as long as possible. And it's easy to puff up in pride in so many ways because that's the soil we live in to boast in our arrogance of knowledge and technology, of medicine, of wealth, accomplishments and beauty and strength. And then we live in the Western world which has its own religious system. Religion is, is based on a set of beliefs, convictions, creeds and confessions, this we believe type statements. It has its own priesthood. It has its own holy days in a calendar. And we live as Daniels amongst a culture in which we are about to enter one of its holy months in June. What is the name of the holy month we're stepping into? Isn't that fascinating? Like a, that we would name a month pride. And then, in, in part of pride, now hang in there with me, okay? It's getting quiet. <laughs> hang in there. This fruit would take one of the holy things of God. A holy symbol that God, God has given to humanity to say here, to remember both God's justice and his grace 
for human flourishing. Says, just to remind yourself, I'm not against you. I'm a God who loves you, but I will judge and be gracious to preserve your life. I'm going to put a sign, a holy sign in the heavens so you can always see it and remember the goodness and grace of God. And what is that? And that's taken by another religion called pride and used in its worship services. It's like, we're living like Daniel. And if you think, dang, Thomas, man, you throw in some stones. That's not my intention because this was, was Paul saying in verse two, like that's only one fruit of pride, but man, there's a religious pride that shows itself up. This is verse one in chapter two. Paul says, therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, you do the same things. You take the holy things of God and you practice your wicked ways. What are the holy vessels of the temple today? Is it not our bodies? Does not Paul tell us in 1 Corinthians 6? Do you not know that your body is the, is the temple, the residence of the Holy Spirit? And we're going to take our hands and our eyes and our ears and our feet and we're going to join them with all kinds of wickedness. We're going to let our eyes, holy eyes, part of the temple, gaze at all sorts of things. Put our minds to these sorts of things. And so I ain't throwing stones I'm putting us all in the scales of God. And each one of us, me included, is found wanting. Remember, remember John 8, the religious community filled with pride? Like they found their person, this adulterous woman. They, they don't even bring the man that she slept with, but they brought this adulterous woman before Jesus. And they just throw at Jesus' feet and they say, the law tells us we got to stone this woman. And it's like, wow, they found their person. And Jesus says, well, I guess the one who's never sinned, go ahead and just chuck the first stone. And you remember what Jesus does next? The finger of God writes in the dirt something. And it doesn't say what it wrote. It is the finger of God writes a message in the dirt. And every religious leader who's puffed up in pride starts dropping their stones and walking away. And there's biblical imagination of what, what does Jesus write in the dirt? Maybe he starts just listing all their sins. I just weighs them out and they find themselves wanting. And Jesus says, there's no one here to condemn you. Well, then I don't condemn you either. What is it Jesus did in that moment? Jesus is doing for that woman what he came to do for all of us is this great exchange. See, see, God himself looked at us, humanity, weighed us out and said, man, they're all found wanting. But I love them. I love them. The root issue is pride. And so I will show them in an act of humility, I will leave heaven and I will come to save them. And all those who would trust in me I would give them my life for theirs. And so when they step on the scales, I don't weigh out their life. I weigh them as though they're Christ. Our men's group memorizes scriptures together. And one of them is just this beautiful remembrance that God made him who knew no sin. That's Jesus. The only one that could be weighed worthy. Him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him, in him, not in my works, but in his works, we might become the righteousness of God. And so this great exchange happens. So all those who are found in Christ, when they are weighed, they're not found wanting. They're found worthy, worthy to inherit the kingdom of God. That's why Paul says in, in Romans chapter one, okay, there's been a divine message written by the life of Jesus. And as sojourners and exiles in the world, what we do 
how we act like Daniel is, let me let the word of God be known and its interpretation so that the world can make a decision what they want to do. They can be like Nebuchadnezzar and humble themselves and embrace God. Or they can be like Belshazzar and remain prideful and arrogant and reject God. But now they know. And so Paul says, oh, that's why I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What Jesus has written, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of God, for it is the power of salvation for anyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For anyone who would come, they would be saved. For in it, Paul says, for in it is the righteousness that you need. It's the righteousness of God. And so how do we live in the world that we live faithfully to God? In the midst of a culture that has a current that opposes the things of God? We are like Daniel. To know God's word and to practice it, to know his word and interpret it so that our world would know what has been written. And I know we don't have the finger of God writing on walls this morning, but man, we have the word of God at our fingertips. In fact, many of us just scroll through the word of God. May we not be like Belshazzar, who knows it and suppresses it. Let us know it and practice it like Daniel for God's ways and they're the good ways. They're the, light, they're the ways that bring human flourishing. And the only way I know how to really end today is not with a song, is just with prayer. Is to pray for you to live as Daniels in a world that does not know your God, that often accuses you of being hateful of being a bigot for holding to some things, holding on to your convictions. And I want to pray that you, like Peter would say, always be ready to give a reason, the reason for your hope, but do it with gentleness and respect. Live in such a way that's what we call winsome, and perhaps the Lord God would allow your life to win some to the faith. It's not easy but I know you're up for the task. And so would you stand and let me just pray for you? If there's anything I've said this morning that you would love to talk to me about, I'll be down here in the front. If you want to pray with someone this morning, our prayer team will be here. If you're new this morning and want to know more about Calvary, there's a, a welcome center. You can pick up a gift on your way out. But let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I ask for my friends. These men and women, young and old, those who are seniors and going to go, go to college. Father, I pray that the love of Jesus Christ for a hurting world would be deep within us. That the word of God would dwell within us so that we can both make the message of God known and understood as Daniel did. And Father, I pray that we would do it without anger, antagonism, violence, but that we would give our lives away like Christ gave his life for us. And so, Father, we thank you that Jesus has come and exchanged our life for his so that we might be weighed worthy. It's in his name we give you thanks. Amen. Love you guys. I'll see you very soon.